really well, right? How the influence is healing and how we can really use that to enhance or inhibit our adjustments. So in 1988, a doctor by the name of Herbert Benson founded Harvard's Mind Body Institute. Now in that institute, he worked there for about 30, 40 years. He even started noticing that treatments that were given to patients were getting them well when later science proved that there was no validity to the treatments. So uh, that really intrigued him. And over his career, he started to uh, yeah, start noticing a little more. So uh, he wrote a book. It's called Timeless Healing, The Power and Biology of Belief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Power's on! Power. We'll get to that. <laughs> so yeah, so he wrote that book, and uh, he goes about you know, 60 pages documenting these events throughout history. And uh, he found that people were getting well when there was no real science to it. So he called this phenomenon forever wellness. And that's what I'm talking about today. The placebo effect. He attributes that, that this gives uh, patients well up to 70% of the time. It sounds kind of large, but we'll go into that a little more later. <laughs> so there's three basic components here of the wellness. So the first being belief and expectancy on the part of the patient. Belief and expectancy on the part of the caregiver. That's us, the chiropractor. And belief and expectancy is generated by the relationship between the patient and the caregiver. So that's you and the patient. Got it? All right. So what Dr. Ben, uh, Benson found was that when patients had faith and belief in the treatment they were receiving, patients got, well, way higher than they would normally. He also found that when a caregiver when didn't really have faith in what they were giving, patients didn't get as well as quickly. And lastly, when patients have a, patients have a certain belief in what they're going to receive from the doctor, and when their expectations were met, whether the doctor was uh, maybe unprofessional or incongruent with what he was saying, patients didn't get well. So, like every coin, there's two sides. So there's a, a negative to this number of wellness, and it's called the nocebo effect. <coughs> so nocebo is uh, negative towards the body. And it's explained a little differently from a doctor. His name is Fred Barr. So I'm going to quote him real quick. You may, you may have heard of him. So, what happens when a medical doctor tells a patient? What happens when a medical doctor tells a patient that you're deteriorated, you're degenerated? What does it do to that patient? What does it deprive them of? It deprives them of hope. Hope is replaced with fear, and fear is a fuel that fires the furnace of disease. Let me say that one more time. Hope is replaced with fear, and fear is a fire that fuels the furnace of disease. Dr. Fred Barr, powerful guy. <laughs> so let's take a second to talk about the sympathetic response in the body. Would you all agree that when you receive bad news, or when someone flips you off in traffic, or uh, here's a new one I learned here in the East Bay, it means asshole. <laughs> Would you all agree that that puts us into a, <laughs> a fight or flight response, that it puts us into a sympathetic response? That response used to be saved solely for when, way back when, when a saber tooth jumped out of the brush and was going to attack you. I was trying to eat you. So, <laughs> but in today's society, small events put us into a chronic sympathetic state, and that's not good. So, take a look at what is happening. Alright, so take a look at this. This is from a journal, an article found in the Journal of Dermatology Research. It talks about the HPA axis, the central hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis found in the brain. What's happening is that stress signals activate the locus ceruleus, eliciting a sympathetic response. That triggers the hypothalamus to secrete corticotropin releasing hormone, which eventually leads to the secretion of cortisol. Now, there's a couple intermediate steps, but we're chiropractors, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> So, cortisol, what's the big deal? The Franklin Institute found that when, elevated level, when there were elevated levels of cortisol in the body, that we weren't, we weren't able to lay down new memories or access previously stored memories. That's pretty significant when you think about kids who have ADD nowadays. It's a pretty, pretty rapid epidemic. Um, next slide, Jamie. This book here is by uh, Dharma Singh Khalsa. He's a medical doctor. And he found that elevated levels of cortisol Degenerate the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is part of the limbic system, and its uh, major role is transforming short term memory into long term memory. He later found that older people have lost upwards of 25% of the hippocampus due to cortisol, increased cortisol levels. It's a pretty rampant epidemic, if you ask me, too. 
So can you go back real quick, Jenny? The last thing I want to talk about in regards to the HPA axis is vasopressin. <coughs> vasopressin regulates the body's retention of water. It does this through ADA, the antidermatic hormone. So uh, ADA is released from the hypothalamus, produced with the pituitary gland, sorry. The pituitary gland and its role is to affect the nephrons within the kidneys and it causes the collecting ducts to retain water, makes them less permeable to water. So this leads to more blood volume, which uh, I'm sure Dan will talk about later on. It's a pretty bad thing. It can lead to high blood pressure. So what can we do? What can we do as chiropractors to affect this? What role do we have? How can we use river wellness in our practice? I believe it's by being congruent with chiropractic philosophy. We all know in this chiropractic unit, the power that made the body heals the body. So what? We've heard this a, many, a million times. But to what degree do we believe it? Is it something we say in the halls, similar to like, power's on, bro? Or I mean, is it something that shapes, or does it shape the foundation of who you are as a pillar as a chiropractor? If it isn't the latter, it's going to be very challenging to achieve uh, remember wellness with our patients. If we do not have the expectation that the body is going to take and adapt the universal force being applied to the body, what chance do we have of getting patients well? <clears throat> they have to know, the patient has to know on a deep level that what you have to offer is going to bring them to a state of ease like no other, no other way can. And this can only be achieved by being congruent with what the chiropractic is, and that is based on the principles laid out for us in Stevenson. <clears throat> this philosophy, it's not something you're going to teach your patients. They're not going to know what the 33 principles are. Um, believe me, I've talked to my parents and family about it, and they don't care. <laughs> and I think you guys have all noticed that. It's something for us. I see it as a flame within us, that special something that's going to attract patients to your office. <clears throat> I think it unites integrity with congruency, and through that, patients feel when you put your hands on their body to deliver a specific, appropriate uh, adjustment at the right time for the removal of vertebral subluxation. <clears throat> I believe, remember wellness, remember wellness can be achieved by being congruent with chiropractic philosophy and by, teach, by following the teachings of Dr. Benson, we can get patients to a state of ease like no other profession can. So thank you all for listening. Yeah.